When I got around Todd and Susan, you want to see these guys light up. You want to see a smile come on this guy's face. Start talking about opportunities to invest and impact people in the world. And he just lights up. It's like you plug him into the wall. I think of Todd and Susan more as the book of Acts than I do a 21st century partnership. These are people who are living fearless, faith-filled lives for the kingdom. I'm Todd Peterson. I'm Susan Peterson. And we met at the University of Georgia in a corporate finance class, Finance 430, if I remember correctly. But we really were not friends then. We were not I friends. I wanted to be friends. <laughs> we were not friends. But um, she blew me off. As I walked down the sidewalk, I was not getting the answer that I was open for. I figured she would say, oh, I did really well. And I would no, say. No, his opening line was, how'd you do on the test? That was his opening line. Yeah. <laughs> to which I said, fine. And I kept walking. Kept walking. Just kept walking down the sidewalk, and I thought, this isn't going where I was thinking. And so we had this 8 o'clock summer school class, and we just started to talk, and we shared the newspaper, as dorky as that sounds. No, but God did put us in there, and she was sitting there, and I thought, that's the girl from my corporate finance class. Uh, maybe God is sovereign. And um, I thought, I'll ask her for the sports section, because she had the newspaper every day. My college football experience was a disaster, really. I mean, I was a very average player at best for my freshman, sophomore, junior years. Uh, I got benched my junior year because I missed a 24-yard field goal to beat Alabama at night in Tuscaloosa on ESPN. No bigger game in college football. We're the number one offense in the SEC. They're the number one defense in the SEC. And I missed a chip shot field goal, zero to zero late in the third quarter. It's probably gonna be the winning kick. Does not even hesitate, he sends in. Todd Peterson to attempt the field goal. Yeah, see, here's a major difference. Ray Goff knows he's got a guy that can bang it through. And of course, last year, this game was decided on a last second field goal. Peterson's only three for seven, though he struggled, but he's got a pretty good leg. This one will come from 24 yards out. Do you believe this? No, I don't. He missed. And so I end up on the bench as a junior, and you know, where do you go from there? I'd spent my whole life trying to perform, and my life was wrapped up in a performance trap. I missed that kick, and I honestly thought that who I was was how I played, or how I played was who I was. My identity was totally tied up or wrapped up in my performance. So I had a college teammate, and he was being transformed by the renewing of his mind. He was in the Word. It was giving him a different perspective on life. And as he's inviting me to Bible study, and as he's speaking truth into my life, the Word accomplishes its purpose in our life. It doesn't return void. And so even though I was resistant to his invitation, the reality was God was doing a work in my life that was transforming my heart. I'm starting to have vision for life I never had. I would, I'd been completely self-serving. How could I get ahead in life? How could I look out for number one? And now I'm thinking about like, what? the kingdom of God, I'm supposed to serve Jesus. Been in the church my whole life, but I had no clue who Jesus was in my heart. God had a plan. Uh, scripture says his ways aren't our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. For whatever reason, his plan for me was to get my job back, not because I earned it. The guy who ended up getting it had mono the next summer. He lost the job because he was sick. They put another guy in there ahead of me. That's how much confidence they had in me. He missed a 34 yard field goal to beat Tennessee. I had no choice but to go back to the guy who failed the year before. And that really, for me, was a great picture of grace. It was unmerited favor. It was undeserved. I didn't earn it. Got my job back, uh, went on a streak, didn't miss a kick, made 12 kicks in a row. And it was like God kind of started to give me a vision for this platform of football because all of a sudden I was kind of back on top of the world. Uh, we were a great football team. Um, we were top five, six team most of the year. And I just started to think, man, this maybe is something. And I didn't dream of playing in the NFL, but in the back of my mind, it was kind of like, could I actually have a chance at this? And so senior season wound down. We ended up beating Ohio State in the Citrus Bowl, finishing six in the country. And I had people saying, you know, you really need to think about trying to kick in the NFL, to which I laughed. I mean, how do you get kick in the NFL when you could barely keep a college job? and um, God had a plan. As I came out of college, I got drafted. Kickers don't get drafted. That was a great indication to me that there's a God. That was a miracle. And so I have this uh, storybook kind of start to an NFL career that ends up being basically a nightmare. 
I get cut, I get picked up, I get cut, I get picked up. And finally, I reach this point where I just cry out to God. If your plan is for me to play, then open a door and let me get through it, because this is ridiculous. It was like right there in that surrender moment that everything changed. And I went to Seattle quickly thereafter, and it was like God just opened up a spigot the next six years. Everything I kicked went through. Um, I rewrote the record books for the Seahawks. At the peak of my career, I was the top 10 guys on the planet that did what I did. 32 guys in the world kicked a ball for a living. I felt like God kept asking me this question. It would just rise up in my spirit. And the question was, was I gonna kick the ball for his glory or for my glory? But I started asking God, you know what, God, bless me so that I can use the influence you give me to advance your kingdom. Todd's NFL buddy had learned deeply about the Bible translation needs in the world. He was very committed to Bible translation and he thought Todd and Susan should be also. One of the moments I remember uh, in that very first meeting was Susan was telling me about the afternoon of that day before we arrived. She had gone out for a long run and on her run she began to weep and she began to cry at the thought of people without the scriptures. Before we had pulled in the driveway, I knew the Holy Spirit had gone before us. So I went to Tanzania. On this particular trip, we were told that we were gonna go out to a very rural area, kind of on the border of Tanzania and Kenya. And on this trip, we were to visit a village. And in that village were some women who had learned to bead. And we were hoping that we could do a little bit of training and that what they were making, we could uh, purchase from them and that it would become an ongoing relationship. They had never before had an opportunity to earn any money at all, and that the idea that they could earn something would change their lives forever. So it turns out the village chief had nine wives, and each Boma was her individual mud hut where she lived with her children. Um, Boma is just a, is a little hut. That particular morning, they asked us if we were going to visit with the women, could we honor this man's youngest wife by visiting her inside her Boma because she wasn't allowed to come out. And she had just had a baby, and in that culture, she's required to stay inside for three months with her child. She's not allowed out at all. They believed that that protected the child. So of course, as women, that's the first thing we wanted to do was visit with her. And the second I got inside, I realized how young she was. And so I just was sort of marveling at that and looking at her child and started to think about what her life really looked like as I sat there and watched her. And I realized, boy, she must be a lot younger than I thought. And later that afternoon as we left her hut, I asked the missionary that we were with how old she is. And she told me she was 13. So here's what I know about that culture. I know that she's the ninth wife of a chief that looks like it could be her grandfather. I know she's been physically mutilated because in that culture when she's married, that's required of her. And I know she's about 13 and she has a baby. And I also know that the best thing that could happen to her is that she would get outside in the fresh air, but she's not allowed. So there was this massive moment where I realized how trapped she really is as a young woman. She's trapped in so many ways. And I was thinking about my own daughter at home, who was also 13, who's in school. I mean, I just couldn't imagine those two girls at the same age on this planet. It, it was more than I could bear. It just overwhelmed me, and for a minute, I, I had a hard time finding Jesus, and I just lost hope. And I remember sitting around the campfire that night, and the missionary friend of mine, her name was Tammy, noticed that I had withdrawn a little bit. So she came up to me, sat down next to me, and said, what's wrong? I can tell today was a hard day for you. Can you tell me what is on your mind? And I told her, I said, Tammy, I cannot look into that child's world. She's a child. I cannot look into that child's world and see the hope of the gospel. Where is Jesus? I am so um, overwhelmed at how trapped she is, and I don't see a way out for her. And Tammy, without thinking, turned to me and looked me right in the eye, and she said, Susan, oftentimes what I have found is that a culture will become trapped in a lie. And out of that lie comes another lie and another lie and another lie until an entire people group is trapped in a web of the lies of the enemy. And then she said this, 
She said, only God's word unlocks the lie. Only God's word unlocks the lie. And I just wept because I knew that was Jesus in the moment. The only freedom she would ever know is if she could know God's word. And that was true for her husband and for, for every woman in that village. The only answer was God's word. For us, that's really why we're so passionate about Bible translation, because what we know is the scriptures change everything. There are thousands of people groups on the planet that don't have the Bible, 1,800 that don't have one word of scripture in their heart language, which means there are 1,800 people groups, hundreds of millions of people on earth who are caught in lies. Think about that. They're trapped in lies because they don't have the truth. And so when we think about what God's called us to, we know He's called us to a few things, and one of them is for sure seeing the nations come to the light, like it says in Isaiah 60. You know, we have this picture of Revelation 7, every tribe, nation, and tongue being at the throne of the Lamb. It's gonna be the greatest party ever thrown, and we're invited to it. But there are hundreds of millions of people who haven't gotten an invitation. What can we do about that? I don't believe anybody has advocated for Bible translation like Todd and Susan. If there were more Todd and Susans in the world, the Bible translation task would be done today. They have mobilized and given and networked and connected and prayed at a level, you know, it wouldn't take but a few dozen of them. There's only 1,800 languages left. 18 Todd and Susans and it would, it would be done. Todd and Susan represent a generosity that encompasses all of life. And so their level of generosity is giving of themselves. When I met Todd and Susan, I you know, realized right away these guys are extraordinary human beings. And I loved Todd's heart right away. You know, there are a lot of guys that are pro athletes, and you're like, oh, that's cool, so-and-so, he plays hockey or whatever, but Todd was more than a pro football player. He was an inspiring individual. And I knew right then and there that he wanted to impact the generations. We began to link more and more with the work of passion and then the planting of Passion City Church. Todd and Susan are original pillars of the planting of our church, Passion City. And from day one, we were intentional with the idea that we were gonna disciple people in biblical generosity. That an expression of God's goodness toward His people was that their lives would reflect generosity. And so they have sort of incubated in all of our thinking this idea that we want to be not the average, which is we gave 10% and we all patted ourselves on the back, but we want to be, as Todd says, people who are a part of radical generosity, stunning generosity is Todd's phrase. He always says that. He works that into every conversation. We want to see stunning generosity. What is that? It's just a reflection of the stunning grace of God. When I think about the gospel, in essence being generosity, like the greatest act of generosity ever was Jesus giving his life so that we might have life. I think to myself, how could I respond in any way other than to give back to God everything he's given to me? I don't have anything to offer him. Everything I have is from him. And so how can I not offer back to him everything I have? Everything Todd and Susan touch has fingerprints on it. They're the fingerprints of excellence, of kindness, compassion, but they're also the fingerprints of generosity, and their fingerprints are all over this house and all over everything that we've had the opportunity to be a part of. So the beauty of the Jesus Life wall is that each light bulb that you see illuminated represents a person who's put their faith in Jesus here at Passion City Church. And so once that decision's made, and we know that they put their trust in Him. They'll put their name on a bulb like this one right here. They'll put a date, um, February 1st, 2015. And they put that bulb in the wall, which is a great celebration. It's pretty awesome, right? Because people are all out here a lot of times in the oval. They'll go up on one of these big ladders and they'll screw their bulb in and people will cheer and go nuts. And it sort of brings you back to the heart of what this is all about. When you come to grips with the fact that literally your life is not your own and it is to be given away and it is to be laid down and it is to be sacrificed in marriage, in parenting, in every context, it's a revolutionary thing. It's a paradigm shift in how you approach life. And I think that's been a hugely uh, cementing thing in our friendship is I love my friend 
we are partners in ministry. God's used us to do some cool stuff, but at the end of the day, he's my pastor. He's teaching the word and I'm transformed by the word day in and day out. And so Todd and I laugh and celebrate and hug when the great moments come. But I also know that when the sky turns dark, when storms blow in, that I can lean and feel someone right beside me that I know that I can count on, sometimes with or without words, just to be in it with me. And every leader counts that person or those persons as the greatest gift they have in the endeavor that they lead.